And we're live. Now, we only have one event. So we're going to, are we going to do back-to-back episodes? Are we out of time? Yes. Should we just do one episode and then do the next one? Because I, I don't have any idea what you wanted to talk about for 602. New colors of gamma <laughs> radiation? What? <laughs> Okay, let's just record one episode. We'll do the other one on Monday. Cool. If the traffic doesn't eat you again. Sure. Is it unusual light pollution? Unexpected light pollution? Okay. It's satellites polluting the sky. Let's go. With yeah, that. I mean, I think, well, but, but that and also just other, I mean, I think the thing that's interesting as well that would be cool to talk about is, um, uh, like LEDs are causing more light pollution than than anybody thought, right? right? Like because so, they scatter so much. Yeah, like we thought, and so people have been overcompensating. They've been saying, "Well, these things are cheap to run, so let's just run many, many more." And so you would think that light pollution would come down because you get this nice directed oh. light that would be perfect. But in fact, no, we don't get that at all. So no, no. Okay. And blue light scatters more than red light. Oh, I'm I didn't know just, that. Okay, so this is yeah. perfect. Yeah. Okay, so we can talk about that. We can talk about satellites. We can talk about just sort of the the implications of that that all sounds good hey okay, everybody i'm just <laughs> and very importantly the path of exile league start begins in 35 minutes so i have a very important league start to begin otherwise i'll fall behind everybody else who's playing what game is this path of exile i don't know that one yeah it's do you remember did you ever play diablo yeah so it's like diablo okay yeah but sort of like the modern version. It's it's like your your goal is to make the screen explode, all the monsters go kaboom, but it's like three-dimensional chess to make that happen in the most efficient way. So there's Okay. Like, yeah, there's like a thousand different skills that all interact in different ways and multiply to each other and all these different Yeah, yeah very complicated. My goal for this afternoon is or I guess evening um, after my work day is over, I'm going to set up to play Valheim. So I shall uh, go forth with my greatest Viking goodness. That's a video game, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How have you played it before? I've heard it's I've no, heard it's good. but I, I keep like every time I open up steam, my, my notifications are like, this all your friends person's are, playing. Yeah. yeah all your friends are playing, playing Valheim. This. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, okay, okay, fine. Two different people have invited me to join their servers. Yeah. And so it's like, it's time. Yeah, it's time. Yeah, I should do the I should do the same. All right. Um, but I but I'm going to be offline for about three months. So <laughs> that's how long the leagues last. And, and I'm getting okay at the game. But like people, people have like 5000 hours. Like, oh, geez. you can utterly know life this game. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's trouble. It's like a Skinner. You can know it's, life Minecraft. It's a Skinner. It's true. It's true. It's like a Skinner box with random rewards. It's like gambling. It's just, it scratches every part oh. of your brain. No, it's super bad. John <laughs> Suffield is going back to his crossword. Um, <laughs> is it a I'm mass, on a space is it a mass multiplayer crossword, John? Massive multiplayer? Yeah. Uh, All right, my camera is slightly drunk. You got to everybody who said hello now, it's lost in the ages of time. So hello to Aaron C., Dusty Reichwin, Ilan Avron, Empowered Path, Cry, Chiropap. Chiropractic. I'll be back. FFL, Guido Bira, John Seffel, Johnny Z, Katrina, Astro, YYZ, Quad Libet, Paul Disney, Paul Gracie, Mom. Susan Hunter, Thomas Trinecker, and Zaff and Zaff. And hey, everybody. So uh, did you all see my interview with Michio Kaku? Were you not amused? I, I need to go amused? watch that. I haven't yet. You're braver than I am. I, I don't have any need to interview him. It was rough. It was funny. So I just interviewed um, Maggie Liu, Dr. Maggie Liu, who is, uh, she's at Notting Nottingham and uh, works with the with the Euclid spacecraft uh -huh. and uh and so she was she was telling me like she was she had sort of reviewed a couple of my interviews just to know what what my interview style was like and she was like yeah so i saw the one with avi Loeb, and i saw the one with michu kaku and you're very serious and i was surprised because <laughs> you did the interview with me and you were like just happy and laughing it was very silly it was very lighthearted. it was very fun and like yeah no the ones with avi Loeb and the one with with michu kaku was not was not um you know my typical you know, it was a, they were both very tricky interviews. And, uh, 
you know, I think with, with both, I mean, I think with, with Michio Kaku, like, it's funny, like, he's like, obviously been on every science channel and every documentary. I mean, you know, yeah. he's everywhere. And when you really dig down to it, he's got some really interesting things to say. I, he gave me, I think, one of the most fascinating explanations for the Fermi paradox that I've heard so far. Oh, really? Yeah, what yeah. was it? Well, so just this idea that that future civilizations will upload their consciousness to computers and then they will transmit that consciousness via lasers to receivers and then they'll they'll reinstantiate themselves in new locations and so from your perspective as the transmitted because you're moving at the speed of light you experience no time and so it's not an uncomfortable travel process for you to move from from world to world and so we should be looking for the receivers of the the laser signals. altered carbon yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Alter carbon is a, yeah. is a great example of that. And and then that would and so it's just like it's the it's the natural outcome of mm -hmm. of an advanced civilization looking to to have an, a way to to move from world to world. Like it's just traveling with the meat just sucks. And yet and yet also trying to detect beings moving as laser beams from world to world is a tricky thing. Um, yeah. So anyway, I thought it was really interesting. It was really fascinating. And so, but at the same time, he's so practiced and has come up with fairly, um, uh, very workshopped, very philosophical sounding language to describe everything because it, you know, it's like people it sells. really, it sells. People really love it. Yeah. People really love to hear this sort of s spiritual conversation style with a, mm -hmm. But it's with an underpinning about made from science, and so yeah. you know, and 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 so for me, it was just a matter, you know, for the interview, I just kept shoving him off of his talking points. That was my, <laughs> right? And so, and and just because I, because I wanted to f hear what he thought, and not yeah. you know, I wanted yeah. to get away from the the conversation. I know we'd had a hundred times on. CNN and Fox News and blah, 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 right. and Stephen Colbert and et cetera. And so it was, um, yeah, it was, it was fun to have that. It was fun to have that conversation, but it was so much work for me <laughs> as the interviewer to, to get to those places. And like, at some point I said, I told him, like, I'm not going to let you dodge this question again. <laughs> and, you know, grab advanced gravitational wave observatory or, <laughs> or neutrino observatory, right? Like, which one do you want? <laughs> You know? And and this is what I love about working with you and now also with Beth Johnson, because I can do interviews, but I'm also scared of some of the people I interview yeah. and it shows. Yeah. And, yeah. and the two of you are much more able to go, no, you're just going to answer my question yeah. and going in there from the journalist's point of view, which is much different from the, and I just want you to explain what you do conversation yeah. standpoint that I go into it with. See, so for me, I'm, I'm looking to get to the very edges of my knowledge yeah. and then find out all the new stuff that I don't understand. And so I'm looking to pick their brains every time. And, and I don't know if, if, if as an, as an interviewer, like if a person who's watching the interviews, like if you're following along all of the my gaining of knowledge, then you're along for yeah. the ride. But if you're fresh and, and you're just like, huh, you know, in, in an interview with Michio Kaku, I wonder what that's about. It might be that it's more technical than a person would want to hear. So, but I don't care. I, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, about, it's about, it's about me. It's about my questions, my curiosity, and people get to come along for the ride. But, uh, but yeah, I know it was good. It was fun. We had, I had a ton of great interviews this week. It was it's, I kind of enjoy that that increased cadence. I, yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So was, we do go ahead. Oh, and and sorry, and with and with Avi Loeb, it was it was you know like he's he's definitely feeling attacked, and it was my I felt like it was my job with that one to really help him understand he's in a just a the perfect position as with enormous amounts of tenure to help bring about the world that he wants to see the to bring about the research into these really interesting ideas like i can't imagine somebody with more clout and authority and capability than avi Loeb. yeah and so you know again it was just like like trying to help him you know it's not about him being attacked it's about the incredible 
ability that he has and how he's inspiring people yeah. to look into this kind of stuff that, that it's okay yeah. to to be creative to be to think outside the box it's not good it shouldn't hurt your career to go i wonder right. if there's aliens building dyson spheres across the galaxy that's fun here's what it might look like now i'm going to work on g general relativity right and i think that's and, great and because he's at harvard his stuff gets an extra look he might not get elsewhere there's there's other people that have this extreme diverse thing of content uh brad schaefer at louisiana state university is one of these and and they just have an ionization zone around them when they speak because they're so enthusiastic about what they're doing yeah and i just celebrate these individuals who take their ability to problem solve and aren't afraid to say that may not be my specific field of science, but yeah. I, by golly, am going to yeah. explore that question. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a bunch out there that I really like. Um, uh, David Kipping is one. Yeah. Uh, Jason Wright. Um, uh, Phil Metzger is sort of great for that. Yes. And, yes. And, and it's funny. And when I find those kind of people, then they almost interview themselves. Like, like, because Phil interviews himself. Phil, Phil absolutely <laughs> does. Amazing. Kipping does. I mean, they all, communicator. yeah, yeah. Fantastic. And it's just so much fun. And you just literally just kind of, you give them just this nudge into the zone that you want to talk about. And then they just go and go and go. And it's just like, they're just dropping, they're just dropping bombs nonstop. You're just like, oh, I can't believe it. I didn't even know that. You know, Phil completely opened my my mind to dust produced by spacecraft landing on the moon and how much of a problem this is. And it's it's influenced the way I look at this whole process now. So, um, yeah, it's been yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun. Um, but I, and I hope That's people are enjoying awesome. them. So, OK, uh, what what do we do? I think theoretically we record episodes right. of Astronomy Cast right. for this podcast we've been doing for okay. like all right i'm in 15 years i'm in let's do and that. we go out as a tv show that's the cool thing we just don't have commercial advertisers yet we're working on it so patreon we still love you so much, so um, much. okay tell me when you're ready i am pressing record i have also pressed record here we go Astronomy Cast, episode 601, Unexpected Light Pollution. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? I'm doing very well. Have you seen the new pictures that NASA has sent back of Bennu, of the landing spot of of Osiris Rex? I, I had a really good laugh because they they have this fabulous animation they did explaining what they intended to do with the mission, which is to basically fly down with their little arm and boop. The, the the asteroid Bennu and then fly away. The the thing is that while their after the fact interview still showed this nice friendly boop, um, in reality Bennu punched really hard, really yeah. hard, yeah. and it was like on its way into the asteroid when thrusters were finally able to reverse its motion after it descended half a meter that's like more than knee depth yeah into the asteroid yeah it's like it's like i'm just sort of imagining like it just sort of plunged its jaws into banu took a giant bite and then kicked itself back out and you can and now these new pictures that came up from nasa like the last day or two, you can oh, yeah. see this scar on the space rock where, you know, where it, where it bit. And yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's so cool. And it's so exciting to sort of see this whole thing. Now it's time for it to come home, but, but it is the capstone on this incredible work that everybody at CosmoQuest did to, to survey the asteroid, to mark every rock, to suggest places that it could land. The spacecraft did the landing and now we see the proof and now the data is i guess the final step will be when the sample is in the hands of the of the scientists and they're actually examining yeah. it instead of saying the film's in the can the rocks are in the can yeah absolutely all the rocks yeah more rocks than anticipated 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, because it jammed its face <laughs> half a meter into the asteroid and it's just overfilled. So, yeah, yeah. Day by day, we're losing our connection with the night sky. Already one third of humanity lives in so much light pollution that they can't see the Milky Way without a drive. And now satellite constellations are adding additional light pollution, even in the darkest skies on Earth. And we will get into that topic in a second. But first, let's have a break. And we're back. Uh, so can you see the Milky Way from your backyard, Pamela? I can, just not very dramatically. We, we have, unfortunately, um, those exact historic looking, not actually historic streetlights that the International Dark Sky Association complains about, where you have a pole with like a teardrop on top. And because they're fake historic lights, they actually have really bright LEDs inside of them. And, and so they make a fair amount of light pollution. So even in my small town, it's we can see it. We just can't see the details in it. Uh, it's not bad for me. I can definitely see it from my backyard. Uh, like where I grew up, it's much darker, but I can see the Milky Way. I can see fainter, fainter objects in the sky from my backyard. I can do some mediocre astronomy. And our town is maybe 25,000 people where I live. And so, but we're surrounded by darkness. And so I just have to go driving maybe 10, 15 minutes and I get to much darker skies. But when you look at those dark sky maps for some people who live, yeah. say, on the on the eastern seaboard of the United States or in Europe, there's there's nowhere they can go that isn't right. half a day's drive away that gets them to the place where they can actually start to see the Milky Way. It's heartbreaking. And one of the things that makes it even more complicated is while a fair amount of attention has been paid to, well, streetlights like the one I have cause light pollution, lighting up historic buildings causes light pollution, all these things, gas stations. Gas stations are a terrible source of light pollution. If something attracts bugs, <laughs> you're probably generating light pollution. That's a, that's a good, that's a really good tip. Actually, we were, uh, we did a drive across of the United States and we got into Minnesota and we stopped at a um stopped at like a road stop, you know, one uh -huh. of the, the rest stops. And the the mosquitoes were just in giant clouds, you know, that would suck you dry in a moment as you yeah. got out of your out of you got out of your van. Yeah, it's terrifying. And they and they were all attracted. I'm sure they were attracted by the the knowledge that human light brings brings blood. Well, but they're the also warmth. And they're fooled just by the light. They think it's the moon yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so the, let's start with, you know, the first thing that that's quite surprising. You know, we're now living in the in the LED age. I don't know about you. I've swapped out all the lights in my house with LEDs. I pay yeah. a fraction of the electricity bill that I used to. Um, and the expectation was going to be that now that we had these new lights that would direct you know, very direct illumination, be able to provide light exactly where you needed, that overall light pollution should be going down in our cities. But that's not no. what happened. No, no, the, the problem is that that LEDs tend to give off more light in the blue part of the spectrum. You can see that in how human beings look. We tend to not have that natural ruddy look we naturally have when we go outside under the sun. We instead look more like I do right now, kind of pale and with a slightly bluish cast. That's from all of the blue light in the LEDs. And as it happens to work, the same fact that blue light scatters super easily that makes our sky blue also means that all of those blue shades of light that are coming down from these low energy lights outside it's going to scatter off the pavement it's going to scatter off the cement it's going to go straight up and bounce around in our atmosphere lighting that sky up and drowning the stars beyond and so what's actually happening with the sky like how is the how is the light interacting with the sky to cause this loss of the heavens for us? 
It's it's an effect that's called Raleigh scattering in a lot of um, situations where as all the different colors of light from the sun pass downwards towards the surface of the earth, the particles in our atmosphere periodically get in the way. And the way scattering works, blue light gets scattered first, and then the thicker the atmosphere, the more particles in the atmosphere, the more colors of light are going to be scattered. So when the sun is straight overhead, sunlight coming through, blue light scatters all over the place, and it keeps scattering. This is why you can look off at the horizon with the sun straight overhead, and you still see blue down at the horizon, because light has just kept bouncing, and eventually it bounces towards our eyeballs. Right, right. Now, as the sun gets lower towards the horizon, you're looking through much more, at, much more atmosphere, and that thicker atmosphere is able to scatter more colors of light, causing the sunset to be red. Now, when we're looking at things in the other direction, light here on Earth will hopefully be directed towards the ground. And the ground's going to absorb some of those colors of light, and it's going to reflect some of those colors of light. The reflected light goes up, hits the atmosphere, and then scatters the same way the sunlight does. So all that scattered light is creating a sky glow, a midnight sky that blocks stars and galaxies. Um, and so, and so that, that rally scattering, we're just seeing it in, in reverse. All right, we're going to yeah. continue this conversation in a second, but first let's have a break. And we're back. And so we can, um, we can mitigate that light pollution a little bit if we're doing astronomy using a special set of filters. Yes. So luckily LEDs, unlike the sun, don't give off their light in every single color of the electromagnetic spectrum. Depending on the chemistry involved in the LED, you get spikes in certain colors. And by combining those certain colors that we can create thanks to chemistry, you get things that approximate different specific colors. I can make a light look red. It may be giving off light in a whole lot of different, very narrow colors that my eyes perceive as red. Now, <laughs> creating filters that block out those specific colors native to LEDs is super useful if you're trying to do astrophotography. It can be useful in some cases if you're trying to do astronomy, but you're essentially saying these specific things I want to study, I'm not allowed to because their color happens to be coincidental with all the LED light that's now polluting the atmosphere. So ideally, we just want people to turn stuff off at yeah. night. Just yeah. turn it off, people. Yeah, and it's, and it's like in order to get the same picture or to get a good picture, you're having to gather light for vastly longer periods of time. So you're, you're throwing out the 99% or whatever is the amount of light that is turning into light pollution. And then you're just keeping that last little bit that's, that's the, the night sky. And then you're trying to, to take pictures using that last little fraction of light because yeah. everything else has been ruined by the moon too. I mean, the moon or just or, or light pollution. And yeah. so, you know, an interesting paper I know crossed both of our desks in the last couple of weeks and this idea that, in fact, now it turns out that satellite constellations are starting to increase the amount of light pollution that we're seeing. And this is bad because it's everywhere, not yeah. just over the cities. And, and this is very much the same problem of just scattered light. It's just the scatterers are much higher up. So we have our satellites, they're orbiting hundreds of miles above the surface of the planet, sometimes thousands. And because they're higher up, they have a sight line to the sun that we may not have at the surface of the planet. So sunlight comes over from behind the planet, hits this high altitude satellite, and that sunlight then gets reflected back toward us. And many of us have probably seen this. You go outside and you see these little faint points of light just across the sky. Today is the day I make sound effects while oh, we record. Great. This is awesome. 
Um, now, while we're used to seeing these individual satellites and being annoyed, I all the research I did, every third image, satellite. Yes. Satellite. And it's getting worse because the numbers of oh, satellites are yeah. increasing. Right now there's whatever – a thousand plus another fifteen hundred Starlinks. Um, yeah, what are you going to do when it's forty thousand? Right, and and so we were fully aware of the problem created by these individual annoying streaks that passed in front of the things we're trying to see and otherwise saturate our detectors. Mm -hmm. What I hadn't thought through, but in retrospect, is kind of obvious, as so often is the case that light getting reflected back to us from the satellites, while some of it comes straight down and hits our eyeballs, our cameras and things like that, a lot of the light, just like sunlight coming from the sun, gets scattered. Mm -hmm. And so scattered light from satellites is brightening the sky. And that paper we read indicates it's brightened it by 10 percent the, the way i'd seen it was that it has the potential to brighten it by 10 percent. we haven't hit 10 percent yet okay but if the constellations reach the level that are being planned it will essentially bring up the base level of light pollution across the entire planet by 10 percent yeah and and, and so and so when you think about this situation like the, for the big observatories located in in remote mountaintops in chile Airplanes aren't allowed to fly nearby them. Cities aren't, you can't build cities nearby them. There is no light pollution. You are in the darkest possible skies. But the satellites flying overhead are going to just add to the light pollution, which is, uh, there's no getting away from it. So this is the situation we're in. And as bad as it is in optical, we're also starting to hit radio difficulties. This this isn't entirely new. The first time we ran into this was with the GLONASS satellites used for satellite telephone communications. And because you want your satellite phone to work wherever you are on the planet, you ideally want to have more than one satellite overhead at any one moment. And you want all those satellites covering all of the planet from equator to pole. So you need constellations. And once you've launched your satellites, no one can really stop what wavelength you're working at. And there have been efforts made to protect the wavelengths of light that correspond to astronomically interesting sources. Mm, interesting. I didn't know that. And Yeah. So 1612 megahertz is one of those colors that attempts were made to protect so that we could better understand galaxies and stars and the chemical transitions that that are possible quantum mechanics tells us exactly where to look and it turns out that communication satellites said uh-uh can't right so if you launch your satellites and use wavelengths you were told not to use nothing can stop that all right well we're going to talk about solutions in a second but first let's have another break and we're back. So what what can be done? I think it's it, it is funny to me, though, that people um, like are, people are outraged. And I think mm -hmm. rightly so that that the night sky is being taken away from us. And I think the ad hoc answer is, let's just build more space telescopes. But that's not a solution. No, there was actually this fascinating image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope that caught a satellite at a higher orbit than it in one of its images. Right. I mean, that won't be the big problem. I mean, no. if the satellites are orbiting below the space telescopes, it should be a solved problem. But there's so many things you can't do with space telescopes, like experiment and learn. Doing yeah. interferometry in space, we haven't mastered that yet. All the things that we need to have massive telescopes capable of resolving the faintest and smallest objects in the sky, we're not there yet. And sometimes you just want to experiment and tinker and try and do iterative design. And you can't do iterative design with something in space, not yet not for a long time even with starship on the horizon right uh, so we need to figure out how to fade our spacecraft yes and 
fortunately, I think SpaceX with the Starlink, they've been fairly responsive to the requests. Now, that didn't stop them from deploying close to 2,000 satellites and, and, and then starting to, to come up with various ways to, to make them darker. But they are being responsive. So what are the ideas that, that they've got? So various ideas from changing the geometry to changing how they align to painting them to using different materials. The idea is to reduce how much light can get scattered back down at the surface of the planet. And this is very much how you work on building stealth technology. It's just in instead of trying to hide from other nations, we're just trying to hide from the sunlight. Hide right. from the sunlight. So let's talk about some of those some of those ideas. So, you know, one idea, as you say, you paint them black. They've tried that with some, and they call them dark dark sat. That yeah. worked. Didn't work great. Uh, definitely decreased the overall brightness by a little bit. They've also tried. Um, they put a visor. They call it visor sat that blocks essentially is blocks the sunlight from reflecting off the satellite, and that worked pretty well, also. Yes. Um, I guess a lower altitude means that they're less, they spend less time in sunlight. And so you've got the, the Starlinks, but they're also brighter because they're lower um, as opposed to the one with. So Starlinks are lower and then the, the OneWeb ones are, are like far higher. And so they're dimmer, but they're, they're visible for the entire pass. And so they're visible in the light of the, of the telescope. Um, yeah. And, and one of the things that intrigues me is, is we're seeing like some experiments being done by other, other nations with things like ultra black to see, can we create satellites that in the wavelengths of light we care about are transparent. Now, the thing with painting things black is they're still giving off infrared Bright light. heat, yeah. So they, so and, yeah, you make the visual astronomers happy, but the infra, infrared astronomers are miserable. And, and this is where we're probably going to be looking at some sort of a combined answer to prevent the light pollution. They're still going to block the things you're trying to see. They're still going to create problems with a lot of our astronomical images, but at least they won't be making the background scar sky brighter. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think, I mean, if we could rewind the clock and like, don't get me wrong, I've got a Starlink. It's awesome right it's amazing um yeah. and like i just i can't wait to be able to take that thing and put it in the car and drive to a remote location and do my work i'm gonna do live streams from the middle of the canadian forest but um yeah i would have loved to have seen a conversation had between regulators and starlink to say let's sit down and let's think through every single possible way that we could limit the impact that these are going to have on on humanity on science on 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 navigation, on future, you know, space debris, like let's, let's sort this out before we launch the satellites and not after. And, and as we've discussed before, this is a very complicated moral question yes. because there are places where people's economic and educational opportunities are limited by lack of affordable internet connectivity from islands to remote places in the wilderness you just can't drop cables everywhere people happen to be yeah but you can drop starlinks yeah and so we are improving the economic and educational opportunities for millions perhaps billions of people yeah and that's an overall good but how do we mitigate the cost yeah it's it, at the very least it's an incredibly complicated conversation that needs to have been had that is yeah. that is sort of the future of humanity but i think that the thing that we can all agree on is that light pollution is already an enormous problem and if you're yes. angry about about the light pollution of satellites you should be furious about the light pollution of the of the lighting systems that we talked about that the fact that already one third of humanity can't see the yeah. Milky Way that that the sky, the sky was already taken from us. And we did it <laughs> bit by yeah. bit house by house factory by factory, and have been doing it for the last 100 years. And there are many 
great organizations that are working to try to restore, protect these dark areas around the world. So how, how can people get involved if they, if they want to help protect the night sky? The flagship organization is the International Dark Sky Association. They are working with the International Astronomical Union and the United Nations, as well as many national park services, to protect the places that are dark today, to keep them dark for tomorrow, and to work on mitigating, well, the impacts that we have from so many other things. Yeah, if you're... So that if, it, it, oh, it's going to say if you're a member of, of, of local politics, work with your city mm -hmm. to try to minimize the to change the way the outdoor lighting is done in your city. There are some cities, I think it's Tucson. There's some cities yes. are doing it really well. Um, if you have a house and you have external lights, think about it from the perspective of how much light is leaking up. Direct your lights. Don't use lights that push in all directions. Don't leave them motion up. sensors. Yeah, mo don't leave them up all night long. Just use them when you need them. Um, get involved and really help fund some of these dark sky locations and help protect some of these some of these more pristine areas and help raise awareness with other people that this needs to be protected uh it's like most people don't even know what they're missing and that's like it's hard to yeah. get them excited or worked up about this thing that's already been taken from them which is which is kind of heartbreaking go out look up while you can and Try to build a future where you can see more than you see today. Thank you, Pamela. Goodbye, everyone. All right. Did you have some names for us this week? I do. So as always, we are brought to you by our wonderful Patreons on patreon.com. I uh, am just pulling up the list. I accidentally refreshed a page. One moment. I'm so sorry. I'm making our editors work for it today. It's a so, cut. He can do it. <laughs> yeah. So today I would like to thank the following wonderful human beings who are part of what make this show possible. Allow us to pay all the people who keep us in order. That's Rich, Ali, Beth, Nancy, all of you. You're out there hurting us and we are cats. All right, so here's our thanks to Adam Annis Brown, Kakawa Seraph, Ed of the Universe, Helga Bjorkog, Nicole Vorsek, Gordon Dewis, Bill Hamilton, Frank Tippin, Joshua Pearson, Thomas Sepstrup, Jack Mudge, Alexis, Richard Riviera, Sidney Walker, Ben Lieberman, William Backer, William Andrews, Ron Thorson, Jeff Collins, Harold Bargain Hagen, Marek Venderney, Ben Floss, Jason Thomas, Arctic Foss, The Lonely Sand Person, Nate Detweiler, Matt Rucker, David, Philip Walker, Elad Avron, Sarah Turnbull, Karthik Venkatraman, and Gregory Singleton. Thank you all so much. You make what we do possible. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Okay, and now we save. And then we save. We are safe. Uh, split the stereo track, make a mono. Save. My hard drive's filling up. This could go badly for me if I don't get this cleaned off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get that where, you, where your, your hard drive is full and your computer just nopes. Yeah, yeah. I I am loving selective sync with Dropbox because all the stuff is out there, but I don't have to have it here. And I have my studio computer and I have my office computer and I can just flow between the two of them and sync them differently. It makes me happy. Yeah, I still manually do the do the upload. Um okay, so I got to deal with this. Gordon Dewis says, you can't take your Starlink outside the cell that it's registered to, at least not yet. In theory, yes, Gordon, but in practice, nobody has been able to find the cells. People are taking their Starlinks on the road. They are taking them dozens of miles farther, and so far their service is working just fine. So um, I think, I think you know, I don't think you, you can't cross the border, but but people have have really not found that that's getting enforced heavily that's... so yeah yeah 
it's pretty yeah. it's pretty cool again like i'm going to t- totally going to take my starlink to my parents place on hornby where they are constantly getting like they've just been waiting for 20 years for reasonable internet and every time I go, like I've tried, like, wouldn't it be great? I go hang out with my dad, hang out yeah. on Hornby. I could do some shows from there. But every time I do, I have to deal with his terrible internet. It's not working. Yeah. And so, yeah, I'm going to bring my, I'm going to bring the Starlink and then I can do shows from, from, from a beautiful you know, remote island. It's great. It's freedom. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, but yeah. And I think it's just man yeah we should have just had more conversations like that's it that's the beginning and the end i think um oh gordon is saying the cells are dynamic based on customer density yeah maybe maybe um quad live it asking for a vampire friend isn't the spectrum of moonlight exactly like sunlight shouldn't it mean that vampires could actually go out during the day he needs a suntan please we need answers this is true the best theories that i've heard are that vampires uh get into trouble when exposed to too much sunlight and that the absorbed wavelengths of the moon alternatively are the exact wavelengths that give vampires problems so either the chemistry of the surface of the moon and the wavelengths of light it absorbs happen to be the ones poisonous to vampires or you have a limiting threshold problem and moonlight is not significant enough to cause issues pick your theory got it i Choose. I love that I had an answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> I have thought about this before. <laughs> yeah. See, I would just go with vampires aren't real, but that's just <laughs> when did when did I become the cynic? Sometimes uh, you have to play into it. Yeah, for sure. You teach you teach some science as you as yeah. you entertain the the uh, the horror dust wump here. Um. Beth Johnson asks, would it be possible to adjust or optimize the orbits of the constellations to exclude the major locations of the largest telescopes? So what they do with some satellites is they actually turn them off as they go over the radio quiet zones. So this has been negotiated with the Iridium satellites, for instance, that whenever they go over the Green Banks Observatory quiet zone for the National Radio Astronomy Observatories of the U.S., they just get turned off. Yeah. But you can't turn off the reflect visible light right. reflectivity of a of a satellite. Yeah. Um. Annie, if you're watching, you left your fancy canned water in my house, and I am enjoying it. They call their canned water liquid death. It it has the most delightful can ever. Um, it, it reads this infinitely recyclable can of stone cold sparkling water came straight from the Alps to murder your thirst. When a group of teenagers set off into the mountains for a weekend of drinking regular water in plastic bottles, they became haunted by an aluminum can of mountain water that was dead set on murdering their thirsts and recycling their souls. Once cracked open, no thirst is safe from liquid death. After actually dismembering its thirst victims, this brutal can of water used the severed body parts of dead thirsts to build itself a flesh suit, which it used to disguise as a disguise to get a job in marketing. But Liquid Death never took the job. It just murdered a bunch more thirsts instead. <laughs> and it has just the right amount of carbonation in it. Mm. And it... It's super tasty water in a can that makes me giggle. It's awesome. All right. Uh, you know what? We've reached the end of our hour, even though we did start late and we apologize and we understand that we're cursed. That was on me. It was, uh, well, but it was also on me earlier in yeah. the week. And then it was on you. It was on you, then me, then you, <laughs> then you. I think is if we really want to figure yeah. this out. Um, but uh, what's happening? What's coming up next? What are you doing? Um, so I I don't think we're having community cocktails this evening, but I could be wrong. So stay tuned to Twitter for that. Um, for those of you who are patrons at, I believe, the $10 level and higher, there will be office hours on Sunday when we get together and we talk about anything you feel like talking about, which could be 
bumblebees and flowers, because sometimes that's a valid conversation to have. Um, the uh, Especially next... with their ability to see ultraviolet. Yes, yes, it's true. And um, I am super pleased to say that our episodes of Daily Space go out this Saturday and Sunday night on Houston's channel 21.10. And I just totally forgot when Astronomy Cast goes out because I'm a terrible human being. I will look that up and I will make sure it's tweeted. But all of our shows are going out on Now Media, Houston, channel 21.10. Perfect. Uh, I've got a bunch more interviews coming up next week as well. So, so buckle up. I haven't put them in the calendar yet. But let me just give you the advanced version of this. Um, oops. I've got... Uh, Mick West is coming on um, on Tuesday, and he's going to be talking about um, UFOs. Uh, but he's like a very good skeptic on the UFOs. He's he's been able to identify, you know, that cr that tr weird triangle shape that everybody. Yeah, of? yeah. The Lockheed Ultraviolet, yeah. uh, lighter than air one. Yeah, Jupiter. Huh? It's Jupiter. So someone has been able to identify a the, there was this image that came out from from the military from the navy or something like that. Oh, the one that came out today. Yeah, yeah, and he's okay. identified it. It's Jupiter with some with some bokeh. So it's, it's so an, another thing that um, a different triangle that got solved back in the early two thousands was there was a whole bunch of farmers and rural individuals all reporting very similar reports of three objects mm. flying in um patterns formation yeah and eventually it was figured out that it was actually massive low-flying uh lighter than air zeppelins that were heavy lift vehicles oh, and because they were triangular with three points and you can't tell distance it looked like three things flying high speed in syn in synchronous right and in it's reality it was just yeah low. so that was a super cool because all of the sightings were along one of the flight paths between yeah. two different air bases um and then i've got uh, klaus pontopedan from uh, the Space Telescope Science Institute on next Friday, so a week today, and we're going to be talking about now they've they've decided on everything that James Webb is going to be looking at, and so we're going to talk about everything that James Webb is going to be looking at. So, uh, okay, all right. Well, hey, thank you everybody for watching us today. Apologies for the late start. Uh, we won't make the habit of this. Um, no. Uh, thanks to all the moderators. Thanks to Beth for keeping being the timekeeper and the um, the restreamer. We appreciate your sacrifice. And thank you to everyone over on Twitch who stayed with us through two episodes of Daily Space and now Astronomy Cast. And if you keep sticking around, we are going to be airing the human landing system announcement that is going on right now. Oh, awesome! We're cutting in, uh, preempted by this show. Um, so. Keep on watching. We're going to keep the science flowing at twitch.tv slash Cosmic Place your bets. 2026, 2028? I'm thinking seven. I'll, I'll take the middle. You'll take the middle. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs> I got to find the button. Where?